Hello, everyone, and welcome to Path to Wellness for Older Persons, Body, Mind, Spirit. This is the last webinar of the Vibrant Voices series for this year. My name is Muriel Howden. I am the Executive Assistant and Senior Outreach Advisor for RTO ERO. I will be moderating today's session and providing active offer for any participants who wish to ask questions or have information related in French. Throughout the webinar, feel free, feel free to use the Q&A box to submit your questions for our guest speakers. Bonjour à toutes et à tous et bienvenue au webinaire Les Voix du Bien-être pour les aînés, le corps, l'âme et l'esprit, qui est notre dernier webinaire de la série Voix vibrante pour cette année. Je suis Muriel Howden, adjointe de direction et conseillère en liaison à RTO ERO. Je serai la modératrice de notre session d'aujourd'hui et je vous invite à poser vos questions ou à partager vos commentaires en français dans la boîte de conversation questions et réponses afin de les soumettre. As we begin the webinar today, we would like to pay our respect to the Indigenous lands that connect us across Canada. And then our board chair, Rich Prophet, will introduce today's guest speakers. I am speaking to you today from the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Odenosoni, and the Wendat peoples which is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We acknowledge, recognize and honor the ancestral traditional territories on which we live and work and the contributions of all indigenous peoples to our communities and our nation. Je m'adresse à vous aujourd'hui du territoire traditionnel de nombreuses nations, incluant les peuples Mississauga de Crédit, Anishinaabeg, Chippewa, Odenosoni et Wendat, qui abritent aujourd'hui de nombreux membres des peuples des Premières Nations, Inuit et Métis. Nous reconnaissons et honorons les territoires traditionnels ancestraux sur lesquels nous vivons et travaillons, ainsi que la contribution de tous les peuples autochtones à nos communautés et à notre nation. Merci. Thank you. Miigwech. Rich? And Rich is going to come to introduce our wonderful two guest speakers. And it basically says that I cannot start my uh, video. There it comes on now. You're here. I'm here yes. Hello, my name is Rich Prophet. I'm the chair of the board at RTO ERO. Thank you for joining us today. RTO ERO is a bilingual trusted voice on healthy active living in the retirement journey. We work with our members and partners to advocate for critical policy improvements to address urgent needs now and create a more secure and compassionate future for everyone. Our three key advocacy issues are senior strategies, geriatric healthcare, and environmental stewardship. The focus for today's session, as, as Muriel mentioned, is pathways, paths to wellness for older persons, body, mind, spirit. It is on a geri geriatric healthcare and senior strategy. I am pleased to introduce our first panelist who is no stranger to our members and older adults in British Columbia and across Canada. Isabel McKenzie is a seniors advocate for the province of British Columbia. Over the last two decades, she has worked in various aspects of care to support older adults. She has served on a number of national and provincial boards and commissions and was instrumental and pioneering a new model of dementia care that is now a national best practice. Our second panelist is Dr. Carrie Lee Cassidy. She is a national leader in posit positivism in healthcare and an expert in cognitive behavioral therapy. Dr. Cassidy is a professor of psychiatry and the clinical ac ac academic director of Dalhousie's geriatric psychiatry program at the Nova Scotia Health Authority. Dr. Cassidy also founded the Foundation of Health, a, nation, a national nonprofit association that supports behavioral change to promote brain health and resilience. I will now turn it over to our moderator, Muriel Howden, to start the webinar. Muriel? 
Thank you very much, Rich. Um, before we begin, I just would like to remind everyone to submit your questions in English or French using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Our two panelists will address as many questions as we can at the end of their presentations. So je vous rappelle que vous pouvez poser vos questions ou partager vos commentaires en français dans la boîte de conversation questions et réponses au bas de votre écran afin de les soumettre à nos deux invités qui pourront y répondre à la fin de leur présentation. So let's begin with Isabel Mackenzie. Isabel, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Muriel, et bonjour, and hello to everybody on the uh, webinar. I am speaking to you from Victoria, British Columbia, which is the uh, traditional lands of the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations of, uh, of our country. So I'm just going to start with a share screen here, get that up and running, and I am going to get somebody to give me a thumbs up that they see my slideshow. Brilliant. Thank you. So I'm just going to start by giving you a little bit of a of a context of the picture of seniors in British Columbia, because it really looks very similar to the national average. And as we know, the national average is usually determined by what happens in Ontario, because Ontario so overwhelms uh, the rest of Canada. So while these numbers are BC numbers, you can expect that they look very similar. Uh, for Ontario. And I know that some of the members of the association live in different provinces. Most provinces look similar. Alberta has a slightly younger population and the Maritimes has a slightly older population. But for the most part, the order of magnitude is the same. So the first thing about seniors is that when we look at 65 plus, where are people living? Over nine out of 10 people over 65 live independently. Uh, they might live in a condominium or a townhouse, but it's their own home. Even at the age of 85, which is when we start to uh, see some significant shifts, we find that more than seven out of 10 seniors are still living completely independently at age 85 plus. About 10% are living in what we might call retirement homes or assisted living, or sometimes it's called seniors independent living where you have your own apartment, but some common dining and activities. And about 10%, pardon me, and about 15% of people 85 and over live in what we would call a nursing home or a long-term care home or a residential care uh, facility. So I think we can take great comfort uh, to know that for the most part, most of us will live the entirety of our life in our own home. And that the it is while it is possible that we might want to move to congregate setting or need a nursing home, uh, in all probability, it's less likely uh, than not that 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 will be required. Income, however, uh, can be a challenge. So the median income for a senior in BC, and this is a little bit higher than the national average. So median, as you know, half is over, half is under, just under $30,000 a year, depending on where you live in the country and what the expenses are, uh, that can be uh, more challenging. Certainly in big cities like Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, uh, it's gonna be much more uh, challenging. But uh, we do know that there are, while there are some income supports, certainly for seniors who don't have workplace pensions like uh, public servants have, it is and can be very challenging and the choices that you have as you age might be a bit different. Looking at the healthcare status is also gives us uh, a little bit of good news and hope and inspiration for the future. So this is looking at BC's population and looking at our diagnostic codes through our uh, physician billing uh, system. So it's a fairly robust, uh, accurate data system. So one of the things to notice is that under 65, the prevalence of dementia is almost imperceptible. It can happen. Uh, early onset dementia uh, certainly does occur. Uh, it's possible, but it's not very probable. It's very rare that we would see uh, the onset of dementia under the age of 65. When we look at over 65, the prevalence in the entire population over 65 is 6%. So that still means 94% don't uh, have a, a diagnosis of a dementia. But what's interesting is when we look at the 65 to 84 age group, actually that number drops to 3%. 
and then rises significantly at 85 plus to 20%. But 80% of people, 85 and over, do not have a diagnosis of dementia. So again, uh, yes, it is possible. The probability of developing dementia does rise with age. Uh, it is a neurological degenerative disease for which we don't have a cure, but there are uh, management tools. But most people will live the entirety of their life, not only in their own home, but uh, as I like to joke, they'll keep all their marbles or most of them, however few or many they may be um, for most of their life as well. And so that's an important thing to think about as we're planning for a future. Even when we look at high complexity chronic conditions. So this category would capture people who have more than one thing. So hypertension in and of itself um, is not uh, placing you in high complexity chronic conditions, but if you had hypertension and diabetes or hypertension and COPD or renal uh, chronic uh, uh, kidney disease, these would place you in the high complex chronic conditions. So under 65, we're a healthy population. 65 plus, 19% uh, uh, of people, one out of five, have high complexity chronic conditions. A little bit less than that in our 65 to 84 group, uh, but pretty much doubles at the age of, of 85 to 35% of our population. But again, that means the majority, 65% of people 85 plus, don't actually have high complexity uh, chronic conditions. Most people actually are quite healthy uh, in, their, uh, in their later years as well. And again, we see this in, in long-term care, uh, where 4% of the population 65 plus live in uh, long-term care actually drops to 2% at 65 to 84, and then at 85 plus rises to 15%. So again, some uh, context for understanding the importance of the whole theme of your uh, session around uh, uh, healthy aging and um, uh, the paths for, for wellness that, that really is uh, very hopeful. Uh, now that is not to say uh, that people will not require long-term care and healthcare services as they age. Some will, absolutely. And the challenge is you can't really predict accurately who is going to require those. What we do know is that for the most part, well, while by the time you're age 85 or 90, your income doesn't actually determine whether you have better health, it does determine the options you have available to you. And that's where I think uh, looking and, and planning and having uh, a plan for the resources that are needed is important. Now, you also wanted to uh, learn a little bit about this office and the role of advocacy. So the Office of the Seniors Advocate was created in 2014, and it's based on legislation called the Seniors Advocate Act, which was passed in BC uh, actually the year before the office was formed. It's, uh, so this is a statutory office created by government. And in the legislation governing this office, we have a mandate to monitor and analyze seniors services and issues. We make recommendations to government and service providers to address systemic issues. It's not a regulatory body. We don't have a regulatory function. Our uh, powers and authority really extend to compelling information from providers, compelling data, and the ability to uh, report directly to the public. We can't actually make the government do anything or make a service provider do anything other than provide us with um, the information. On an annual basis, we get about 13,000 calls and just under 3,000 letters and emails. And we have a, a website that gets just under 100,000 uh, visits a year. So obviously uh, an interest out there. And, and you know, in BC, we always, when we're looking at Ontario, we always multiply by three. Um, and that would be the proportionality for uh, the application to Ontario. So in terms of the effectiveness of the office and what can this office do, and you know, these are just a, a, a little bit of a catch all of some of the headlines. The main, I think, power of offices like this and this office in particular has been the power to empower the public, particularly seniors 
with the information, uh, with the data, that it is our job is not to defend what governments are doing. Uh, to some extent, we will explain what they are doing, but we can identify the gaps and we can put out the information that if you can capture the public's imagination on the issues impacting seniors, you will see that the political will to address those issues will follow. So if we look in British Columbia, this office started reporting on our hours of care that were delivered in long-term care, which led to the recognition we weren't delivering the hours of care that we uh, had a policy to deliver, which led to a commitment to increase those hours of care. And we have effectively reached that milestone now. And we've seen that in other areas as well. When we talked about in the income uh, area, a senior supplement in British Columbia that is for our lowest income seniors that hadn't changed in 27 years. And in the most recent budget, we saw a doubling of that amount. Again, bringing the attention to the public of these issues and then the public are who is going to push uh, the politicians and the political will to make the changes. So I think there are, there is value uh, to offices like this. I think there's value to regulatory regimes as well, but just within the, the realm of advocacy, I think um, there is uh, a tremendous amount of, of value. And it would be my hope that we would see uh, similar offices to this in provinces across the country. That hasn't happened to date. Newfoundland uh, does have an office of the seniors advocate, uh, at, but they're a small province. And so it's, it's maybe a little under-resourced. And New Brunswick has one that shares uh, common uh, uh, administration with the office of the children's uh, representative or the children's advocate uh, as well. The challenge from a federal perspective is that most issues affecting seniors are under provincial jurisdiction. The only thing under federal jurisdiction are the income supports of CPP, OAS, and GIS. And so uh, while a, a federal seniors advocate might be effective, really it is the provincial level where you see the, uh, the levers, if you will, uh, that are need to be pulled in order to see real changes in the lives of seniors. So, there is the contact information for my office. Uh, the website is there, lots of information, and you can uh, call my office and get a live voice uh, answering your call, and we'll hopefully direct you in the right into the right uh, space. So I will stop sharing at that point and turn it back over to you, Muriel. Thank you, Isabel McKenzie. Thank you so much for this great presentation. Just a reminder, we'll take the questions after. Um, so we will now be welcoming Dr. Carrie Lee uh, Cassidy for her presentation. Thank you, Muriel. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to this important group. And um, I'm speaking to you, as was mentioned, from Nova Scotia, which is the territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, and I also wanted just to commend the uh, organizers for the diversity of perspectives, uh, geographical diversity here from one side of the country to the other. And also the theme um, from policy and advocacy at a sort of structural level to this talk, which is um, also very much about empowering people, but in a, a slightly different way, in a less of the top down and more the bottom up kind of way, which is um, what can we do? as individuals in our own lives. And the theme here is how to thrive in retirement. So I find with my uh, my own work that it's uh, helpful in working one-on-one uh, -on -one with people or even just thinking about it for myself to stop and have a bit of self-reflection. So if we're gonna think about how to thrive in our retirement phase, it helps to stop and think about what are my expectations, my hopes, my fears, and to put those out on the table. So for some people thinking ahead, um, it tends to be you know, the fantasy of what it will be when we finally don't have to be cracking the whip at work all the time and that we'll have this ability to kind of 
start the party, you know, can't wait, the clock is ticking down. <laughs> Some people are very, very eager uh, for this next chapter. Another uh, possible fantasy would be escapism. You know, we finally get to go to the Caribbean for any length of time we want, or some other way of really relaxing and, and de-stressing, and that this is what retirement means to us. Likewise, there can be a lot of worries and fears about this future uh, unknown phase, um, whether it's impending or you're already in it, um, you know, that it could be really boring and dull sitting at home twiddling your thumbs with nothing to do uh, and an anxiety about what it means to suddenly have all this unstructured time. Or it can be a real fear of becoming lonely or isolated or even uh, possibly depressed in the face of, of uh, such a big change in lifestyle and cut off from friends and colleagues so it can actually, uh, when the when people actually experience um, the retirement, it can be a combination of these things. But let's face it, the current context to reflect on is extremely stressful uh, around the entire globe. Um, so when we reflect on our life, it has to be put in the context of current reality. So no matter what your hopes, fantasies, or fears might have been, it's all entwined now with the impacts of an epidemic that has changed everybody's lives in countless ways, uh, limiting us, restricting us, uh, forcing us to behave in completely new ways, uh, socially, uh, from a health perspective. And also a reality of our, our current times is the broader, you know, global environment, political and natural. Um, I don't know about you, but I find this fall to be rather warm out in Nova Scotia. And we have right now, you know, the global summit on climate change. So at a global level, there's stress, but at a personal level, the reality of one's day to day life can include the care of an of, a, of an aging parent. So you're dealing with one, you know, one's own aging, but also family members who may become more frail, need our help, we may have adult children who are going through their own life stresses, problems, maybe divorce, conflict, what's happening for the grandchildren or their children, your, your, your dear grandchildren, and how you may help or uh, be part of that, entwined with that. And then concerns for yourself, um, the, you know, the chronic conditions, as Abel referred to, um, do increase with age. And, and so there may be uh, new health issues that you have or maybe coming around the corner that are a source of stress. So in this context, with our fantasies, our fears and our realities, what does it really mean to thrive, which is the title of this talk? If you look at the definition of what it means to thrive, it is to progress toward or realize a goal despite our because of circumstances. In other words, we don't have to have perfect conditions in order to thrive. In fact, the resilience research would say that one doesn't have resilience unless it's in the face of struggle and conflict. So it is a precondition to the development of resilience. And so to progress towards a goal, even though we have these conflicts, these fears, um, it is really possible. The question is, are we armed with the right knowledge, tools and support to thrive? to make the most of this next phase in our lives? Um, and, and how would you know? So the Fountain of Health is trying to empower people with the right knowledge, tools, and supports. And it's a, a project that I've been involved with. Uh, if you go back a slide there, Muriel, for about 10 years now, uh, it's a knowledge translation project that is a nonprofit offering training and tools to support people's well-being at any stage and phase at the level of the individual organizations like yours and uh, clini clinicians who are doing this frontline work. Um, so we don't have policy, but we offer tools and, and training. 
You can find this information on our website, which is fountainofhealth.ca. Obviously, it's a play on the fountain of youth. Um, but who needs youth when you can have good health, right? So you can register for uh, workshops. The Optimal Aging Workshop is a four-week virtual workshop if you're interested. And also there's an app, which is a web-based app that you can use if you have the internet and an email account. So there's no going to a store downloading. It is usable on any device. It's called the wellness app, uh, wellnessapp.ca. What you'll uh, find on the website in the next few months is a new learning center uh, where we will be making it even easier to register and log in for the various courses and training that's offered here. The Thrive model of well-being involves uh, six key domains that I'll get into in a minute. And before I do, I wanted to acknowledge others in the team, just so you know, this kind of work isn't done in isolation. Clearly, I have a a large uh, community of professionals involved in this work. You can see the different organizations who are partners in the leadership team. And I just want to draw your attention to Dr. Erica Frank, who is Canada's research chair on preventative medicine. And, uh, and so she's a member of this group if you, um, okay, yes. Yeah, so we have three people highlighted here. Dr. Dilip Jesty on the left there is the founding father of what's called positive psychiatry and a mentor of mine. Dr. Michael Vallis, uh, next to the, in the top left, is uh, the uh, beha a behavioral psychologist who founded the Behavior Change Institute. And then Dr. Erica Frank below him is uh, the Canada's Research Chair of Preventative Medicine. So together we're doing this work to try to get the message out across Canada. So when we think about what does it mean to thrive, um, it's worth thinking about this illness wellness continuum that um, that basically the idea of um, waiting for a disease to strike us before we begin to consider how to promote our well-being is often uh, the way we go, but it may not be the best the best path um, that many of us will sit in what we could call a comfort zone that, well, there's no problem here, so I'll just keep going. Um, and, and yet there are some places in some countries and some uh, venues where there's even lower levels of chronic disease in the older population. So while we do very well, as Isabel mentioned, like the majority of people um, are, are aging in a healthy state, um, it is possible to further reduce that burden of disease in a population overall. And when you look at what are the you know specific ingredients to help with that, of course, you know so social determinants of health, a lot of things that are environmental, you know, make a difference. But there are things at an individual level that people can do that protects health. And so, becoming uh, moving out of a comfort zone and becoming more proactive as an individual or within a community uh, to optimize health is something that is that is possible and something that I would encourage you to be thinking about. Why bother? So why would we work on these things? It turns out that um, only about 25% of human longevity is accounted for by inherited family genes. In other words, there's a huge amount of our health that is determined at an individual level by what's called epigenetic factors. And that is things that happen after our birth, after the things we're born with. And so of course, environment is a big one, but so is um, our own personal lifestyle and even our outlook. Fascinating work on um, how longevity um, and optimism um, go hand in hand. And I wanted to take a minute to tell you about this uh, concept in neuroscience called brain neuroplasticity. And it has become a little better known, but it's really a brand new idea. And that is that it is possible for the brain to continue to rewire, to continue to set down new neurons and reshape itself throughout our entire lives, even into old age. And as a group of teachers, um, this should very much resonate. 
um, that you know we talk about lifelong learning, well, it, it happens at a cellular level. The ability to shape our own minds through our activities is what the focus is on in the Thrive model. These are high impact activities and habits that shape our minds and shape our bodies in a way that protects us against chronic disease developing or, or, or making it more difficult to cope with. That is uh, our thinking habits, physical health habits like physical activity and our nutrition, our relationship habits, the way and the quality with which we connect to others, our interests and our ability to continue to challenge our mind with you know, absorbing pastimes and, and uh, challenges. This one is a key in the Thrive model. It is matching our values, what we think is most meaningful with us, with the things we spend our time on and doing it in a way that allows us to actually accomplish them. And our emotional habits, how do we um, de-stress when the stress levels go high? How do we um, use our awareness of our emotions to uh, acknowledge them? And whether we're getting into actually mental illness to recognize that and to seek help appropriately, these are all really key. And in en français, les traits de, de pensée, l'habitude de santé, relation, intérêt, valeur et émotion. Merci, Muriel. <laughs> so the science of well-being um, could be translated then into these actions. And this is what I find very exciting and why I've been doing this for 10 years. And it's regardless of socioeconomic, it is independent of cultural affiliation. Obviously they need to be translated into um, opportunity and access and a sense of community, but actually often disenfranchised communities do this better in some ways um, they will connect with each other. They will be generous in their social engagement. They will have a lot of compassion for one another, um, show, show kindness. Um, but when people think about what makes people happy, it turns out to be a lot of things that is accessible to anyone. Money does not buy happiness. Opportunity actually often buys misery when you think about um, the things that actually show in science to improve people's well-being, it is time affluence. Time affluence, which anyone moving into retirement is going to have, in, uh, I hope. It is the ability to be idle while also at other times then being engaged in interesting, absorbing activity that gives us mental flow without distraction and interruption nonstop. It is thinking about others, showing compassion, not only to others, but also to ourselves, having gratitude for whatever it is we have. And when you think, when I think about in the uh, Mi'kmaq community, there's a teaching of um, the elders of, of, of basic principles, which really you know have to do with virtues like, um, there's a lot of overlap in those teachings and what science is telling us promotes our well-being. Good citizenship. So self-esteem, unfortunately, in our culture, we tend to overemphasize self-esteem at the expense of community, at the expense of what you would call self-compassion. So if we are too invested in what we would accomplish, and some social expectations of success, the minute we falter, we can be really hard on ourselves. Uh, we can be highly critical and ash feel ashamed. And that leads us not to even share our hardest moments or admit them to our, even ourselves or to others. So what helps us thrive is actually the ability to speak in a compassionate way to ourselves in our hardest moments. 
I wanted to give you a couple of anecdotes that um, lets you know that physicians are also in need of this work. And I'm working with colleagues um, in projects to bring this to the physician audience. So here's an example of a colleague who has been using the, the Thrive approach and he posted it on social media. So Dr. Chris Frank set the goal to do a wheelie on his bicycle. And he had been hoping to do this since he was six and he decided it was going to happen before he turned uh, 60. <laughs> so he did manage and he says, Fountain of Health rocks. I set this goal and it has improved my quality of life. What did Dr. Frank do? There, here are the three steps. Step one is that self-reflection, which we talked about earlier. Where am I now in these Thrive domains? Second is to set a goal, and it's not just any goal. It's a micro goal. The third is to write it down and track the progress at least over a few weeks. It sounds uh, very basic, but to do it is a different matter. What's so important about the tiny goal is that it sets us up for success. And when we have success, what happens is called the cognitive ripple effect. So this tiny little drop of water hits the water. And what happens from there is the cognitive effect. And that is, instead of feeling helpless, the thoughts change to ones of self-efficacy. I can do this. That was fun. I think I'll repeat it. It over time becomes a new behavioral habit and our identity shifts from being a couch potato, let's say, to somebody who is invested in their personal physical health. And that is the magic of the tiny goal. What's beautiful about it and exciting is that no goal is actually too small. As long as it's moving in the right direction towards improved self-care, improved health, that something that you think you could enjoy and stick with over some time um, that's what makes the difference in long-term health outcomes. Uh, just like an airplane, if it shifts the degree of its trajectory by one, one degree at takeoff in a couple of minutes, it won't have a, any impact, but over a few hours, it could land in a very different city or even country. Does this work? I'm happy to say, yes, it does. We've tested this in over 2000 clinicians who are trained to use this approach with their patients. And in over 1,500 subjects, uh, we have um, had our outcomes that showed, I think it's on the next slide, Muriel, that um, over 80% of people at least partially meet that goal within four weeks, but better than that, they have improved health attitudes and increased self reported well being. And that's what we were hoping for. So I invite you to learn more about the science of well-being and behavior change through the Fountain of Health website, through the Optimal Aging four-week workshop, um, or through trying out the wellness app. And as I mentioned, we're trying to put together a, a, um, a better interface for the public on these tools and how to access them through the Learning Center, so stay tuned. Yes, I hope we can have further discussion about this, about what does this mean for you personally? Um, what would mean, uh, what would a purposeful retirement be for you at a personal level and in a broader sense in your own families and communities? How could you bring this knowledge um, to help you? Wow. So first of all, a very big thank you to, um, to uh, Isabel McKenzie and Dr. Kerry Cassidy. Uh, incredible presentation. So we're, we're now uh, entering uh, the question uh, and the answer phase of our, um, of our session. Um, I see that we have actually a lot of questions that have come in. So this is great. I will send them to Dr. Kerry Cassidy or Isabel McKenzie. And of course, if uh, one of you want to add, please don't hesitate. So, um, just un rappel que vous pouvez poser vos questions uh, en français ou en anglais dans la, la boîte questions et réponses qui est au bas de votre écran. Nous allons répondre au plus de questions possibles dans le temps que nous avons uh, avec Dr. Kerili Cassidy et Isabel McKenzie. Um, so, I'm going to start with the first question. I think this one actually came 
during your presentation, Isabel. So I think this one would be probably for you. I know you were talking about this. Um, what causes the percentage drop in the age group from 65 to 84? Uh, two things. First of all, uh, the denominator is much larger for the 65 to 84 group. So uh, the proportion drops, even though an absolute number may be larger. And in order of magnitude, it's about 800,000 people in the uh, 65 to 84 compared to about 120,000 in the 85 plus. So that's part of it. But I think the other part of it, and that was, that was uh, the behind showing the age stratification over 65 is really to understand that for a good part of our life in retirement or as a senior defined as 65 and older, we're actually very healthy. Um, and that it's really when we start to get into our mid 80s that you're starting to see these issues. And even then, you're not seeing them as predominantly as the, uh, the images or the, the preconceived notion would have us believe. I think the very important message, and it's reinforced by what Dr. Cassidy was saying, is that when you look at where we are in our health, uh, from age 65 until we die, most of us for most of those years are pretty healthy. And we need to think about that and the kinds of things we can engage in that can help us, as Dr. Cassidy has said, increase those number of years and push off uh, the uh, years of disability for want of a better term that we may exp experience in our final uh, months or years or years of life. So really it's a reflection of the fact that most of us uh, when we're seniors are pretty healthy, just like most of us are living in our own homes. Thank you, Isabel. And actually the, the next question is for you, but maybe uh, Dr. Carolee Cassidy will want to add to it. I think it's really a continuation to what you, you just said. The question from Mallory is, but to what extent might these numbers reflect a lack of diagnosis for senior 85 plus due to the thinking that they mention high complexity conditions are simply natural at that age? On the high complexity chronic conditions, it's not an, uh, an underreporting if you've gone to a physician for that condition. So these are based on diagnostic codes. Um, on the dementia front, uh, there's always this debate, right? Every illness and disease is undiagnosed until it's diagnosed, right? So every disease uh, where we're giving prevalence is by definition under reporting because there's people who have not yet been diagnosed. I think the issue is by the time a person's activities of daily living have been impacted by a dementia, they are diagnosed. So are there people out there with undiagnosed dementia? Absolutely but it's at a stage in their life where it, the impact is mild enough that they haven't gone to their physician uh, or gone to the emergency department or the hospital and had this formal uh, diagnosis made. One of the, you know, this is a lot about stereotypes and ageism and we, seniors can be as guilty of it as everybody else. And one of the stereotypes is that you're gonna, lose your mind and you don't have, and we really have to think about this because it links to capacity and our ability to make decisions for ourselves and the uh, willingness of others, particularly uh, governments to step in and decide that they should be making the decisions for us. And we saw that in spades uh, during the pandemic, particularly around visit restrictions and long-term care. So we need to be very, very careful. Um, there are the, the brain, like the body, slows as we age, but it doesn't seize, right? The difference is we can see the body still functions, albeit maybe a little slower at 85. We don't see the mind as it's working and it's slower, but it's going to get there. And so we project onto older adults, particularly those as they get into their 80s, our need to step in 
when really if we just give time and space, just like they'll get across the street, it might take 90 seconds instead of 60 seconds, they'll get to the conclusion that they need to get to. It just might take them 90 seconds instead of 60 seconds. That is such a good point. It's really so much to change in the mindset as well. Um, Dr. Kiri Kessie, did you have anything to add to this? Um, yeah, no, I would just echo some of what Isabel has said and just maybe elaborate a bit more is that um, ageism um, and stereotypes about aging is uh, is a, a very big issue for us in in our culture. Um, and it, it can foreclose our own future um, through uh, kind of a self-determined um, destiny. So in other words, there's research showing that our own outlook about aging um, has an impact on health outcomes. And without getting too much into that science, it's one of the areas that I find really fascinating. And I've reflected a lot about this, so in a bunch of ways. One is that society, culture, medicine included, hasn't caught up with the greatest success story of modern medicine. That in the last hundred years, our life expectancy has nearly doubled from 50 to 86 or more. Um, in a very, very short period of time of human history. So up until 50, 100 years ago, 50 was a, an advanced age. And now we have this whole other, almost a whole other lifetime ahead of us at, at that midpoint um, that we haven't quite figured out what, what it means. And medicine is very much at fault too for pathologizing aging as a gradual deterioration of our faculties and our physical health to the point of death. But that is not the human experience by and large. You know, often people are discovering all kinds of things about their potential. Um, and we see every day because of the sheer numbers of people who are much older in, you know, in their 70s, in their 80s, look at the Queen of England. <laughs> You know, or her husband, you know, who are thriving well into a very, very late stage of life. Um, to know that this is this medical model is very limited. Um, and so I think it's really important that we help society and ourselves break that down and to be tapping into our human potential, which is why I'm so interested in positivism in medicine, because it's sorely lacking. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Isabel, I'll send the next one to you, although, again, I think Kirli may have to add as well. Um, this question came in French, so let me read it in French uh, first and then I'll read it in English. So, the question is, hormis les résidences de soins longue durée, est-ce que l'instauration des communautés de vie pour aînés est une bonne idée? So, apart from long-term long -term care residences, is the idea of senior living communities a good one? Uh, yeah. For some, for some people, it is. I mean, I think you know the biggest uh, takeaway is people will want to live differently in retirement, just as they want to live differently before retirement, right? Some people want to live in the country. Some people want to live an urban life. Some people want uh, the lock it and leave it convenience of a condo. Some people like to putter in a garden. We don't fundamentally change who we are, so. Well, social engagement is absolutely important, but what constitutes social engagement is different for different people. Some people, you know, uh, a daily interaction, for some a weekly interaction, for some it's minute by minute interaction. Different people will have different uh, thresholds for what is required to keep them engaged. So communities with many people, will absolutely work for some people. There will be others who will say, not for me. And I think it's our job to just respect that people, people's capacity to make a decision about where they wanna live and who they wanna live with stays with most of us for a very long time. And we just need to respect what people choose. Carolee? Yes, so, some have referred to um, institutional living um, as like apartheid of Western culture. 
uh, this assumption that older people only want to be with other older people is clearly not true uh, for everybody. And now, of course, there's pragmatics involved that once somebody needs nursing care level of care on a day-to-day -day basis, there are just some pragmatics that make it necessary. But uh, clearly, you know, as Isabel points out, what would be ideal is that people could shape um, their own future and have a wide variety of choices about what that might look like. Thank you. I'll stay with you, um, Carolee, for the next question with uh, from Mona. Um, and, and of course, Isabel, please feel free to add to it. But the question is, how do you meet the needs of the various ethnic communities? Yeah, I touched on that a bit here. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, the limitations of the work that I'm involved with is that it, um, it isn't embedded within um, Health Canada or the Public Health Agency or some other major um, effort to enter into as many communities as possible. The method by which it would be ideal would be to start with dialogue about what's important in, in any given community, um, what's the response, and then a co-creation of how best to translate the science um, and these approaches in that particular community. Um, but I touched on the fact that a lot of the basic principles about what makes for well-being um, is cross-cut is cross-cutting, and therefore, um, you know, would, would be really relevant. And in some, in many communities where there's um, less affluence or less opportunity, people will um, already have a lot of. Um, uh, these aspects that promote well-being embedded in the in the fabric of the community, uh, but certainly there are going to be community uh, specific issues and challenges related to social determinants of health, access, opportunity, poverty, and so on that would have to be addressed. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'll uh, I'll um, send probably the next one to Isabel um, McKenzie, and then I will actually, for the following question, I will call the chair of the board, Rich Prophet, and our CEO, Jim Grieve, um, to help us with this one. But I'm going to go to Phil's question. I need to tell you, Phil is actually writing to us from England. So I just want to say we're welcoming our participants from all over the world and all continents, and we're delighted about this. So Isabel, here's the question. Um, so social isolation is a real threat to vulnerable seniors. The heat dome in the summer 2021 resulted in hundreds of deaths of vulnerable seniors in Vancouver alone. Is, is there some type of programming or registration possible to identify vulnerable seniors living without family or without community support? Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, and I think that that is a piece of work we're doing here in British Columbia right now, where we saw during a, a four day heat dome, uh, the consequences of, I think it was about 800 deaths and 70 some percent of them were people over the age of 65. We're finding that uh, the biggest risk factor was living alone. Um, I, it may even be the, an exclusive risk factor. In other words, every case was a person living alone. We're still getting that data. And then looking at other factors. So living in an apartment did that enhance but you know one of the things is living alone is a risk factor for a whole host of things so the heat uh, dome and heat exhaustion and not understanding what's happening uh, until it's too late is but one example but falls uh, you know if you live alone and you fall uh, you can uh, be unable to call for help and be undiscovered for several uh, days. Uh, medication errors, there's just a whole host of things that tell us um, living alone without any connection is the risk, right? So it is around how do we, uh, how do we get on a, a more daily basis the kinds of connections that will provide uh, uh, that sense of security. And, you know, um, it, it, the person's in England, where, of course, the best thing to come out of England was the road to Scotland. But other than that, um, it was over in the UK, where about, I think it was three or four years ago, they had this Minister of Loneliness established, right? And it caused a great cacophony of uh, media sound. And you sort of sit back and you go, wait a minute, the government's going to tell us we all have to play with each other. At the end of the day, government doesn't solve this. 
we solve this. This is about us as individuals. And it's about whether the person is 90 or 20. And it is about this shift we've made. When you think about it, all this automation that's made all these things easier have disconnected us from everybody. We don't talk to the checkout girl at the grocery counter anymore because we scan our own groceries. We don't talk to the bank teller anymore because we do our banking online. We don't, uh, you know, the list goes on. Uh, we don't go into the post office to get the stamp anymore because we don't mail anything, right? And at every one of these benefits of more time, we've removed ourselves from interactions with people. And that's, I think, those chickens have come home to roost. And more so for older people who are more likely to live alone. So at the age of 65, I can't remember, it's something like 20% of people live alone. But by the time you're 85, that more than doubles. And as you keep going, it's going to increase. Generally, it's the death of, of the spouse. And at that point in life, those interactions that we had in our daily activities of life, we need those and we've got to think about unintended consequences of some of our modern approaches to things. That's right. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. So, um, Carrie, I will send the next question to you. I will start with you, but I will also call the chair of the board, Rich Prophet, and our CEO, Jim Grieve, um, who may have to add to this. So let's start with you, Dr. Cassidy. At the simplest levels, how may everyone fight ageism? So the simplest is, of course, to start with things you have direct influence over uh, at a personal level. Um, there's lots of other more complicated things, but if, if I'm to try to be true to your question, um, and Isabel referred to this too, is um, there's, a, there's a body of literature, it's called the stereotype embodiment theory. Uh, but to say that in simple terms, it's basically ageism directed at ourselves. So because of the negative uh, cultural stereotypes of what, what it means to grow older, in general, we'll think of somebody who's older as anybody who's at least 15 or 20 years older than we are, rather than ourselves. So if and when we start to see signs that represent this stereotype, a gray hair or you know a new health condition or trouble with vision or whatever it is, a new, you know, new problems that remind us about the stereotype. Um, it can have a very negative effect on our self-esteem. And this is this, this a sort of negative self views about aging. So Becca Levy out of Yale University studied the, the effect of negative self views about aging and found that people who had a more positive outlook lived seven and a half years longer than those with a negative outlook. This is twice as long as the benefit of not smoking or being physically active. Loneliness similarly has a, you know, a very big impact. So that's what Isabel was talking about. That's why there was a minister of loneliness established because the health impact was finally recognized. So valuing ourselves, having compassion with ourselves for any changes that we might be experiencing and going through, um, is it a very important first step? It makes us uh, more likely to empathize with those who are further along in that process. And also, by empathizing with ourselves, we're better able to take actions rather than to feel helpless, depressed, or disengaged. Thank you. And Rich? Uh, thanks, Muriel. Uh, <clears throat> following along with some of the concepts that Dr. Cassidy mentioned, uh, loneliness and social iso isolation, uh, very interestingly, RTO ERO Foundation started on uh, October the 6th, a program entitled Chime In. And this is where any member can join from uh, across Canada uh, every Wednesday from one to two, and they discuss various topics. Now, I know I've been involved in three of the sessions and very simple uh, concepts. Last week, we discussed what types of music people like. I know I was in uh, chat rooms with people from Kamloops, people from uh, uh, Algonquin, people from Toronto, people from Ottawa, various groups. But every week, people are involved in this. And 
uh, they've indicated that they are lonely and that's why they're involved. They, have, they enjoy the opportunity to interact. Uh, that's one thing. Education, I think uh, Alison said, hey, it's up to us to decide what has to be done. And very interestingly, and in one of the upcoming editions of Renaissance is a balanced life. And what we have to address is, as the two speakers said, it's not just the physical uh, exercises that we have to address, it's the mental uh, components that we must address. Because if you don't address the mental concept, then stress comes into play. And uh, the greater the stress, obviously the greater the problems that are with respect to that. As I said, education, I, I've noticed in Dr. Cassidy's uh, list of groupings that it was, one was the International Longevity Center. And that is where RTO, ERO has become involved uh, with the uh, UN Convention for Older Adults. That's what we're advocating very much so uh, with respect to that. And, and lastly, I just wanna say the education, we know we need a cultural change. Unfortunately, in some cultures, uh, the indigenous culture, the, uh, those who are aged are highly regarded. But in our culture, oh, well, Rich, you're doing not too bad for a guy that's 75 years old. Well, that's a very negative concept and we have to change those, that idea and that is called education uh, with respect to that. Jim? Well, uh, thank you very, very much. And uh, Dr. Cassidy and uh, Isabel, you're doing a superb job in stimulating the conversation here. Uh, but the, the issue here is <clears throat> fighting ageism. That's the question. How do you fight ageism? Rich has given you some really terrific uh, ideas about what RTO ERO is trying to do with and for our members and seniors across Canada. Um, I'm a little hoarse today because I'm going to talk about personal commitments to fighting ageism. And that is the 10,000 steps a day, the nutrition that you've got to keep as much as you possibly can, the engagement, the entertainment. I'm a little hoarse today because I finally, after two years, was able to get back and sing with my band last night. So mm -hmm. I need to get my voice back in shape here. It's family connections. For two years during this pandemic, you know, it's not good enough to see grandchildren and children by Zoom. It's not enough. You know, in the last few months, being able to have them here and in the backyard and share a meal, so, so important. These are the things that keep me young and keep me, you know, really engaged. I don't even think about the number uh, of the birthday. I think more about what can I do to, to sustain friendships and sustain that connection with family and look after my body as well as much as I possibly can. I don't worry about these well-deserved gray hairs because I earned them, every one of them. And ageism is just a, a place, I think. It's just, a, you were surrounded by ageist issues, but you're only, you, you only have to pay attention to them if you really, really must. Because as we learned earlier in the week, we had a lovely um, webinar uh, from Candy Palmer, who was speaking about the, oh. the um, the, the experience of the Indigenous experience in Canada. And she said, you've got to understand that you first have to love yourself and that you have to be available to the others. You're, you're a terrific person. Look in the mirror every day. And that's, I think, that whole mindfulness notion of being centered is so, so important. And our Renaissance magazine, which has won numerous, numerous awards, features issues on exercise and nutrition and mindfulness and all of those things that fight the issue uh, that we're talking about here, which is ageism. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Thank you so much. So I uh, thank you, Rich Prophet. Thank you, Jim Grieve. I'm going to move. Time is going way too fast. Um, so I'm going to move to our, our last a few questions because we are, believe it or not, down to our probably 10, 12 minutes. Um, the next question is for Dr. Cassidy, but I think the, the next couple ones I'm going to send to you, um, Isabel McKenzie. So uh, the next one uh, for you, Kiralee, is um, are there any studies linking screen time exposure to world news and decline in well-being? 
That's a good question. I mean, I, I think I'm not up on exactly that specific niche, but what I can say is <clears throat> that we do know that um, our thoughts have a big impact on our well being. And so anything that stimulates our thoughts towards worry um, and catastrophe. Um, will have a negative impact. So it's important, I know there's been general advice put out there that it's important to basically have a bit of a media diet. So choose very carefully, like healthy nutrition, choose very carefully the sources of information, limit the time spent there, um, decide just how much of a portion you need to feel informed. Um, try not to do that right before you go to sleep at night. Um, and that sort of, that kind of anything that sets off your nervous system. So it's a very individual, I suppose, in a way, anything that sets off the nervous system to the stress response, um, that then leads to an interference with sleep at night, um, will have a negative health effect. Um, and there's no doubt that we've been super saturated in, in a lot of very distressing news, um, the realities of the situation um, has ha has affected all of us. Um, and so the consumption of that media is is a really important aspect um, to day to day well being and, and, and making uh, very selective choices there. Very nice. Thank you, Kiralee. Anything to add to this, Isabel, or I'm sending you the Possibly the last questions because the time is 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 moving fast. So, okay. um, I, and I know Carly, you'll have lots to say on this. So here's for you, Isabel, to start the the, the question from Garth. It's a personal um, comment and question, but the truth is, it's obviously touching so many people. I'm 86 years old, and I have had a very happy and positive 30 year retirement. My major issue is to is dealing with the loss of my wife of 62 years of wonderful marriage. This type of loss will affect all couples. I do not believe you can prepare for grieving and the resulting feeling of loss. Um, do you have any advice? Uh, well, uh, he's right. Uh, there's nothing that can prepare you for it uh, in reality. And in reality, it's going to happen. Everybody out there who's married uh, and living with their spouse one spouse will predecease the other in all probability. Uh, I do think it's harder when you're older. I think that losing a spouse at a young age, 45 or 50, is tragic in another way, a life cut short. But for the spouse that remains, they're active and engaged. They're probably in the workforce. They're focused. They have, when you're older, uh, what has happened to a greater extent is that your spouse has become your social network and that um, the loss of that can be uh, profound for many. I think recognizing it is important. I think understanding uh, the importance of a peer relationship. So who can, I, who can most empathize? Somebody who has also experienced it. And, and having those networks and finding a way to link into those networks, whether it be the loss of a spouse through death uh, or whether the loss of a spouse through Alzheimer's or dementia, that's another kind of loss that spouses can experience as well. Talking to people who've shared that experience is, uh, we believe, the most therapeutic for, for many, again, not all, but more than somebody who hasn't experienced it, but has theories on it. Right, thank you, Isabel. Um, before we welcome uh, Jim Grieve again for final remarks, um, Dr. Kiri Cassidy, did you want to add anything to what Isabel no, just said? I, yeah, just my, you know, my my sincere condolences. Uh, you know, that kind of a loss uh, at any age and stage is so very difficult and requires a great deal of strength to endure, uh, a lot of self compassion, and really, you know, being able to speak to yourself the way you would your most loved person. You know, as as you deal with that loss, can help. Uh, provide some soothing and solace, and also just uh, to flag that in the context of that kind of loss, people can start to develop signs and symptoms of a depression, which is a clinical uh, condition. So if in that 
state after a month or two, if there are those features, it would be being sad all the time, you know, most of the time for two weeks in a row with loss of appetite and general loss of interest or self-esteem. Those are things that are worth seeking direct help around. You know, it's such a pleasure to hear you both speak. Um, we view ourselves as RTOERO as kind of seniors advocates extraordinaire across the country. We certainly believe in that sort of fountain of health as well. And in many cases, you know, where we're dealing with social isolation, we've been proactive for years in this organization in having what we call in each of our districts, a goodwill representative or several. These are people who take the time to either call or visit the senior seniors among us, among our membership, uh, just to check on them, but also to have that conversation. I remember someone saying at one point, this is a representative saying, I went for my five minute visit to drop off a poinsettia in the holiday season and stayed three hours. And more than anything, that social isolation, that connection uh, with another person is so vital and so missing. And you know, the whole notion of, can we find a way to bring uh, that kind of um, uh, inter-age uh, groupings together so that we have young children and older adults uh, very close together because there's a fountain of youth also from that uh, wonderful source of, of the early years. Honestly, um, Isabel, thank you so much for today. And uh, Dr. Carrie Lee Cassidy, amazing, amazing. I mean, we could go another hour, as Muriel said. Um, this is, um, sadly, this is the end of our 2021 Vibrant Voices series. We are gearing up for 2022, which comes around the corner in a couple of months. Uh, I, I hope that um, you'll continue. There's been over 350 people involved in this one today, at least the, that, that's the number I saw. And we've recorded this, uh, so it's uh, going to be posted on the website, and that's on vibrantvoices.ca. Uh, it'll take a couple of weeks because we make sure that it's um, AOD compliant and that it is bilingual and available to you uh, very shortly. So, um, you know, we're working on our webinar series for 2022. We'll keep everyone informed about what's coming. We're looking for your ideas too. Are there people you'd like to hear more from in this case or in addition to? So uh, stay tuned. Thanks for joining us again today. And again, thank you to Isabel and to uh, Carrie Lee for just a phenomenal opportunity to engage our members. Take care and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much.